Hi everyone, welcome to week two, part one of ESS3 Oceanography. This is the second week of our course, part one of week two. So today, um, what we're going to talk about, there's going to be sort of two parts of today's lecture. First, we'll talk about water, water as a molecule, and why water is so unique and so important to us and life on Earth. And then we will talk about salinity. So we will learn about um, some differences in freshwater versus saltwater um, in the way that saltwater works and is situated in our oceans. So for the first part of lecture today, um, by the end of class, by the end of this part, I hope that you are able to explain um, the molecular bonding of water and why that results in some unusual properties which we're going to go over, um, including cohesion, surface tension, uh, solvent, and then also the thermal properties of water. So there's a couple different really important thermal properties of water that we'll go over, specific heat, latent heat, uh, melting and boiling point differences, as well as um, the density. So it's really unique that ice has a lower density than uh, liquid water. So hopefully by the end of the first part of this lecture, you will be able to um, explain and describe all of these components. So water is um, incredibly important. As you remember from last week, it covers the majority of our globe and most of the water on Earth is salty. It is ocean water, not our fresh water. Um, it is also the only substance on Earth that occurs naturally in three states. So you can find natural water in a solid, a liquid, and a gas state somewhere on Earth. The only substance that occurs naturally in all three state, in all three of those states somewhere on Earth. So there's some pretty weird properties. Um, we like to say water is weird. It's weird, but it's awesome. So water is very strange. Um, it has interesting properties being that it has very high surface tension. So it has actually the highest surface tension of all um, Liquids, it's very cohesive, meaning it, it sticks together. Um, it dissolves more than any other solvent. It also has really interesting thermal properties um, when we're talking about heat and temperature of water that are very, very important for the weather and climate as we know on Earth. And ice floats. So we're going to go over all of these things today. So to start, we have to understand what is water. So if we head back, zooming into the uh, molecular le level of water, um, we have to remember about atoms. So if you think back to any chemistry that you've maybe had before, you might have heard of atoms before. Atoms are the building blocks of everything. All matter on Earth is made up of atoms. Um, atoms have protons, neutrons, and electrons. The number of protons in the atom tells you which chemical element you're looking at. So the definition of different chemical elements depends on the number of protons in that atom. So protons have a positive charge, neutrons have no charge, and electrons have a negative charge. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, the center of the atoms. Um, electrons circle around in this electron shells. So that's what these orange dots are on the, the blue lines. So when we think about water, the molecular structure of water, the chemical formula for water is H2O, meaning there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So that is what this diagram shows here. Here's one hydrogen, another hydrogen, and one oxygen. And this is how they are bonded in this shape. So they are um, bonded by what we call covalent bonds. So the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen are very, very strong. It requires a lot of energy to break apart an H2O molecule. So to break the hydrogen away from the oxygen or the oxygen away from the hydrogen, it takes a lot of energy because these bonds are very, very strong. 
Something else that's very unique about water is that um, it is bonded at an angle. So we say that it's bent. So instead of having hydrogen directly um, parallel to each other in a straight line, we have this bent um, orientation. And all H2O always has this bend in the molecular structure. What that means is we call this molecule polar. So polar is important. Um, it means that it has very weak negative um, on the oxygen and then very weak um, positive sides off of the hydrogen. So here is a video to show you in 3D what a um, water molecule would look like. So two hydrogens or one oxygen, of course, in that bent structure. This looks something like that. So we have our one, uh, the red there is the oxygen, the two white are the two hydrogens. So uh, water is unique because it forms bonds with hydrogen, hydrogen bonds as we call them. Um, all substances have bonds, so between molecules all substances can bond um, depending on the substance that you're looking at. So the polarity of the oxygen means that there is a small negative charge on the oxygen. So if we remember, there is a small weak negative charge off of the oxygen. This means um, there is also a small positive charge on the hydrogen. So we have a positive charge on the hydrogen. We have a negative charge on the oxygen. This means that these water molecules can be attracted together. So the um, positive on the hydrogen is very attracted to the negative on the oxygen. That's what these dashed lines are showing. So here we have one H2O, H2O molecule. The positive on the hydrogen is going to be attracted to the negative on the oxygen, meaning that these are very um, strongly attached to each other. So they will actually attach to each other. These are called uh, hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bonding can be very strong in water molecules. So this means that the molecules are very strongly attracted to each other. So water is very attracted to more water. Hydrogen bonds are quite strong. Uh, they are not as strong as the covalent bonds, which is holding the individual H2O molecules together, but it's still strong enough to have that attraction from one H2O molecule to another H2O molecule. So that hydrogen bond, keeping all of these molecules together, what this results in is water has a high surface tension, um, high solubility, there are also really unique thermal properties of water and interesting uh, density properties of water. So we're going to go through all of these in this first part of the lecture, but the whole reason that we say water is weird is because of the molecular makeup. So those covalent bonds very strongly holding the H2O together as a molecule, and then the hydrogen bonds that are strongly holding the water to each other, or attracting, I should say, the water molecules to each other. So your first question on your lecture quiz will be, what is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that a water molecule could form with other water molecules? So what is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that an individual water molecule could form with surrounding molecules. Take a second, use this um, figure to help you try and guess what you think the answer would be for this. So what you would be looking at is where can the water molecule bond with another molecule. So if we look at this individual H2O right here, so here's the O and the two H's. So this individual water molecule right now, here it has, uh, it's already bonding three times. So here we have uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen 
that's one. Here we have two, the hydrogen to the oxygen, and then you can also bond from its hydrogen to another oxygen. So that's three that this diagram is showing you. But potentially, if we were to expand, add some more molecules to this diagram, we would also see that this hydrogen would bond to another water molecule's oxygen. So the answer would be four. There's potentially four hydrogen bonds that a water molecule um, could form with surrounding water molecules. So each molecule can strongly bond to four other nearby molecules. So I am going to now go through those interesting properties of water. And now that you know the molecular makeup, you know why water is a little bit strange because it has those strong bonds, um, it'll be much easier to explain what that all means. So the strong hydrogen bonds between water molecules cause the water to have very high cohesion and surface tension. What this means is that particles of water stick together. So this droplet, for example, if you were to put another droplet nearby, they would stick together. They would combine together. When you see uh, raindrops hitting your windshield, say, as you're driving, um, you'll notice that as the water streaks down your window, the droplets are going to combine together. That's because they're attracted to each other. Instead of this being uh, hundreds of teeny tiny little droplets, it's one droplet. So it, all of those little molecules of water have combined into one drop. Cohesion is where it makes the particles stick together. These hydrogen bonds also cause for very high surface tension. So there's tension on the surface of the water. There's some certain organisms like this little bug that takes advantage of that. So this bug is actually able to walk across the water. Um, if you've ever seen, it wouldn't so much be uh, in the ocean where you have waves, but more in flat water, maybe a pond um, or a lake. You can see these little uh, jumping bugs on the surface of the water. They are actually um, walking or standing or balancing on the surface of the water because that surface tension is quite strong for water. So because the hydrogen bonds are so strong, keeping that water connected, these bugs are able to lightly walk just across. Of course, that doesn't work for us. It'd be pretty cool if it did, though. Uh, the next interesting thing about water is when water acts as a solvent. So remember that water is a polar molecule, which means that um, instead of being in a straight line, the uh, molecular structure is bent in that um, angled setup here, like you can see. Um, what that means is that polar molecules can stick to other polar compounds. So other compounds that are also polar um, will be very attracted to water molecules. What this does is it causes uh, a reduction in how attractive uh, ions are to each other, which means it makes it very easy to separate other ions and dissolve the other ions into water. So water can dissolve almost anything if that thing also is made up of polar molecules, if you give it enough time. For example, salt very easily dissolves in water because the polar molecules of water are going to uh, reduce the attraction between the Na and the Cl of NaCl, which makes salt, which is going to allow for that salt to fully dissolve in the water. So this is why the ocean is salty. It can dissolve uh, almost anything as long as it's polar um, and it holds a lot of the elements that we need for life. So the nutrients that not only us but everything on Earth um, rely on are often dissolved in our ocean water. So the next piece a little bit longer. This is about water thermal properties. So first, to start talking about thermal properties, we have to differentiate between temperature and heat. So they are not interchangeable. Heat is the energy of moving molecules. So molecules, when they warm up, uh, they move more. The amount of energy 
of those moving molecules is heat. Temperature is just a measurement of energy. So temperature is just a measurement. We use either Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin to represent temperature. Heat, however, is in a unit of energy. So they're not interchangeable, the words temperature and heat. So the first thing to talk about are changes of state. So this is something interesting, as I mentioned at the very start about water, is we have all three states of water naturally occurring on Earth. So from a solid water, which is ice, uh, we can melt to form liquid water. Liquid water can then be vaporized or evaporated into gas, water vapor. Gas can be then condensed into liquid water. Liquid water can then be freezed into solid ice. So we can also go from solid ice straight to water vapor, which is called sublimation. Water vapor can also go straight to solid ice by skipping the liquid phase called uh, deposition. Those are a little less common. So these molecules, they're held together by these, they're, excuse me, they're held together by these strong hydrogen bonds. But as the molecule gains more energy, the molecule is more easily broken apart. So what happens is as the solid uh, ice gains more energy, it's going to melt into liquid. It will then eventually, eventually vaporize into gas. Um, gas is much more, much easier to break apart the molecules than the solid is. In, so, in a solid, the molecules are very locked in place. They're stuck in that structure. That is why it is a solid. Whereas when you add more energy, melting and then vaporizing, your water molecules, the molecules can separate and move around freely. Gas, the gas form of water, which we call water vapor, um, the molecules are not connected. They are free to move around in the air. They, we call them independent molecules because there's no longer um, hydrogen bonding connecting the multiple um, H2O molecules. So, Water can be a solid, a liquid, and a gas, and water very strongly influences the Earth's heat budget. So how heat is stored and transferred and emitted and absorbed on Earth is um, hugely influenced by water. Again, because water has some very interesting thermal properties and it makes up the majority of Earth's surface. So we're gonna go through each of these, A, B, and C here. Uh, the interesting things about the melting and boiling temperatures of Earth, we're going to get into specific heat and heat capacity, and then latent heat. So in a few slides, you will uh, fully understand water's bizarre thermal properties and what makes water so unique and so helpful for life on Earth. So when we think about um, the melting and the boiling temperatures of Earth, uh, of Earth, excuse me, of water, um, the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. That is uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, both the freezing points and the boiling points of water are unusually high. So if you look at this graph here you see the blue columns are showing you the melting point of water and the freezing uh, excuse me the boiling point of water if you compare to a similar compound they are much lower water has a much higher melting point and a much higher boiling point than other compounds of that are comparable so of similar mass so let's think about why that is. So the reason for that is because water has high a high heat capacity. Heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree Celsius. So how much heat is it going to require 
to raise that amount of water by one degree Celsius? Or how much heat is it going to be required to raise that one gram of sand by one degree Celsius? So water has a very high heat capacity, which means it's going to require a lot of heat to raise water by one degree Celsius. Water does not change temperature easily. It takes a lot of heat, very high heat capacity, to change the temperature of water. So water can take in and lose a lot of heat without changing temperature. So you see on this graph here, we have heat capacity. Water is much larger um, than all of these other uh, substances here. So the specific heat of an object is the heat capacity per unit mass. So the heat capacity for a specific unit of mass. So really it's the energy needed to raise one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So how much heat is it going to require to raise a kilogram of water by one degree Celsius? The specific heat of water is very high. So the analogy that I like to use is to think about the beach. So which has a higher specific heat? Which is going to require more energy to raise that substance by one degree Celsius, the beach sand or the seawater? If you think about walking on the beach in the middle of the day, let's say you're, you're down in Newport Beach, you're in Laguna Beach maybe, it's a super hot day, the sun's been out all day, it's the hottest time of the day, you're walking on the sand, Think about how your feet would feel. They would be very, very, very hot. You would actually want to run down towards the water and maybe stand in the cooler wet sand because the sand gets very, very hot during the day, whereas the water stays pretty much the same temperature all day long. Then if you think about walking on the beach at night, if you've done, say, a bonfire at night or you take a walk with your dog on the beach at night, you're gonna to want to wear shoes because the sand is actually going to be quite cold. The sand can be very cold at night, even when it's dry, because the specific heat is very low. So the heat needed to change the temperature of beach sand is quite low. It fluctuates throughout the day. The sand will be very hot during the day. It can be quite cool at night, whereas the ocean is going to stay about the same temperature all day long. Over the course of a year, the ocean does change temperature, but over the course of the day, it's going to be very constant. That's because it takes a huge amount of heat to change the temperature of water. So the seawater is going to have a much higher specific heat than the beach sand. The seawater is going to require much more energy to raise the seawater by one degree Celsius. So when we, move, we add or remove energy and it causes a change in temperature, we call that a uh, sensible heat or sensible heat flux as in the change in sensible heat. Sensible heat truly means heat that you can sense. So if you touch something and you notice that it's warmer or it's colder, you are um, experiencing the sensible heat. Water has uh, one of the highest, actually the highest, um, specific heat of any common liquid substance. So it's actually 4,190 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. So on, in your discussion on Thursday, you'll deal with, um, there's a couple questions about the specific heat of water. So you'll get some experience working through um, some questions in your discussion on Thursday. So if we look at specific heat and heat capacity of different objects, here we have um, this image is showing a kilogram of water with an initial state of 10 degrees. If we input that 4,190 joules, that is what it's going to require to increase this one kilogram of water from 10 degrees to 11 degrees. 
if we double the amount of heat, so now we input 8,380 joules, we will have increased that water to 12 degrees, so by increased by 2 degrees. Here, if we take 1 kilogram of water and compare it to 1 kilogram of soil, uh, we have our 1 kilogram of water, we input that 4,190 joules, so we know that water is going to increase by 1 degree. If we input the same amount of energy to our soil, mostly sand, it's going to increase from 10 degrees to 15.24 degrees. So the soil is going to increase much more than the water will. So take a second to try and practice this problem. If we assume the specific heat is 4,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, so I'm just simplifying the numbers for you guys because this is just a quick question. Uh, let's say the water temperature is 14 degrees Celsius to start with. The water receives 12,000 joules per kilogram over the day. What will the final water temperature be? So take a second to try and figure out how you'd go about this problem. Okay, so I hope you have a guess. Um, the water temperature starts at 14 degrees Celsius and it receives 12,000 joules per kilogram over the course of a day. So what you want to do is figure out, well, how many degrees is my water going to increase if I'm, give, if I'm inputting 12,000 degrees, uh, 12,000 joules per kilogram. So what you then do is you can divide the 12,000 by your specific heat, which is 4,000, to get an answer of 3. So your temperature of your water will have increased by 3 degrees over the course of this day after receiving 12,000 joules per kilogram, which means that your answer should be 17 degrees Celsius. At the end of the day, your water will have risen from 14 to 17 degrees Celsius. So you'll get some practice working with your groups on Zoom um, on Thursday with a couple of questions like these. So now we know the specific heat is the energy that's needed to raise a kilogram of a substance by one degree. Uh, moving, excuse me, removing or adding energy that causes a change in temperature that you can feel is called sensible heat flux. And we know that water has a very high specific heat, highest of any of our common substances, um, which means that water has a very high heat capacity. It can absorb huge amounts of energy or lose huge amounts of energy without changing the temperature very much because it requires so much energy to change the temperature in the first place. So this is very, very interesting for Earth and Earth's climate. So of course, this is coming back to um, water on Earth specifically. So the high specific heat and the high heat capacity actually moderate the temperatures that we have on Earth's surface. So for example, the oceans at the equator do not boil and the oceans at the poles do not freeze solid. There is some freezing. We'll talk about sea ice at the end of today. Um, but we don't have frozen solid oceans up in our poles. Uh, the marine effect, as we call it, the oceans 
are able to moderate the temperature changes from day to night and during different seasons along our coasts. So you'll notice the temperature, say uh, in coastal Orange County, is much different from inland. So you always hear on the radio, oh, it'll be uh, 95 in inland LA County, but at the beaches, it'll be more in the high 70s. That's because the ocean is actually moderating the temperatures. So the ocean is moderating those temperatures, making the temperatures more even throughout the day and night close to the ocean. The continental effect that we also see is that land areas have a much larger range in temperatures. So further from the ocean, further, like I was talking about inland, is going to see much more dramatic shifts from day to night and also during different seasons compared to coastal regions. So that large heat capacity of the ocean is what moderates our climate and prevents huge changes in temperature, especially in coastal regions. So you'll notice um, this graph shows the difference between daytime high temperature and nighttime cool temperature. So the red and orange colors are where there's a big difference between night and day temperatures. So where it is much hotter during the day, we have um, uh, red colors, where we have uh, much cooler during the night, we have uh, blue colors, and then where there's really no change from day to night is this light blue color. You'll notice that almost everywhere along the ocean has no change from day to night in temperature. And the coastal regions have much less of a change than inland, for example. That's because of that moderating effect of our ocean due to the high specific heat, high heat capacity. It takes so much energy to change any amount of water by any degree um, of temperature that we just don't get that much energy um, from day to day to change the temperature of our oceans drastically. The land, however, with a much lower specific heat and lower heat capacity is able to change drastically throughout the day from day to night. So this brings us to a phenomenon called uh, the land breeze or the sea breeze. Um, if you are used to living in a coastal area, you might be familiar with this. Uh, during the day at the beach, if you're sitting at the beach, you'll notice generally the beach is pretty windy. It's always windier at the beach than it is inland. This is because during the day we're experiencing sea breeze, which means there's always wind blowing from the ocean towards the shore. So if you're sitting at the beach, you'll notice that it's windy. You'll also always notice that the wind is blowing in your face if you're sitting looking at the ocean. The wind will, for the most part, um, always be blowing at your face, sort of blowing your hair backwards. If you go back to the beach in the middle of the night, you would actually notice the reverse because there's a switch that occurs. And the reason for this is the heat capacity differences between the ocean and the land. And you standing on the beach are sort of right in the middle. So what happens during the day is that the land heats up very, very quickly. Remember the low heat capacity. It doesn't require a lot of heat. So the land's going to heat up. The sand under your feet is going to be very, very hot. Whereas the ocean will be quite cool. It's going to stay the same temperature. What this means is uh, the air over the beach, over the uh, land, is going to be very, very, very hot, and it's going to rise up because heat air rises, uh, hot air rises. <laughs> so that hot air is going to rise up. As that hot air rises up, it needs to be filled in. You're not going to have a lack of air here. So air from over the ocean is going to move in to take its place. What this does is throughout the day is it builds this circulation as air moves. So the air is going to move from the ocean towards the land. That air will be heated. It's going to rise up and then continue filling in that circulation. 
Then what happens at night is it switches. So at night, the land is going to cool down significantly, whereas the water is going to stay the same temperature. So the land will actually be cooler than the ocean. So now the the air right over the ocean is actually warmer, meaning that water, uh, excuse me, that air is going to rise up. It's going to be replaced by water over the land. So the air over the land is going to come in and take its place in the atmosphere. We will then have this circulation forming the same way, but in the opposite direction. So the key to remembering this is to remember which has the lower specific heat and lower heat capacity, which is the land. So in which situation is the land going to be warmer? During the day, when the land is absorbing all of that extra energy, it's going to be very, very hot. We are going to have rising air there, causing a circulation where at the surface, so if you're sitting here on the beach, you will experience wind coming off the ocean. Whereas at night, if you go back, you would experience wind blowing from behind you out towards the sea. Because at night, the land becomes very, very, very cold, so the ocean's actually warmer, causing that rising air to be in the opposite direction. So that is land and sea breeze. So let's check if you are at, on Earth's surface at night. Which direction will the wind be blowing at night? You can use the figures to help you. At night, we would be looking at this bottom diagram here. Diagram here. We would have our wind blowing from the land out to the ocean. It would then warm up from being over the ocean and rise, helping this circulation stay in place all night long. So the answer would be B, from the land to the ocean at night. So the next piece of water's interesting thermal properties is called latent heat. So what we were just talking about um, in terms of heat was sensible heat, so changes in temperature that you can feel. So now we are going to talk about latent heat. Latent heat and the change of latent heat, which we call latent heat flux, is energy that causes a change in phase. So evaporation, melting, freezing, condensation, vaporization. It doesn't change the temperature, but it uses that energy in order to change the phase of a substance. So water has very high latent heat of vaporization, for example. Very high, um, actually the highest of any substance. So it requires a lot of heat to vaporize, to go from a liquid to a vapor. So when we think about latent heat, we think about the change in phase. So if we start with the solid, here we have our ice. In order to melt into water, into a liquid, this ice requires energy. The ice will absorb energy. It needs energy in order to melt. And then, for liquid water to evaporate into a gas, it needs energy. So this needs more energy. This liquid water needs more energy, will absorb more energy in order to vaporize into a gas. The gas, however, in order to then condense back into a liquid, it needs to get rid of energy. So it actually needs to release energy in order to transition into a liquid. The liquid then needs to release even more energy in order to transition into solid ice. So here I have some examples um, of heat flux. So take a look at the four examples and try and guess before I tell you which is an example of sensible heat rather than latent heat flux. So the three of them are latent heat. Which one is an example of sensible heat?
So remember that sensible heat is a change in heat that you can feel. You could feel the change in temperature. Latent heat has no change in temperature, but creates a change in phase of the object. So if we look at these, keeping your temperature stable by evaporation of sweat, you are evaporating the sweat. You are changing your phase, so this is latent heat. Melting of ice cubes, you're melting your ice cubes, that is latent heat as well. Evaporating water, the same as evaporating your sweat, that is latent heat. So the answer here would be D, heating up a pan of water using your stove. If you touch that stove, you touch that hot pan, you are certainly going to feel the change in temperature. So D is going to be an example of sensible heat. The other three are latent heat flux. So the largest, not maybe not the largest, but very large latent heat exchanges occur um, during evaporation and condensation. So evaporating water into gas and then condensing gas into liquid water. Um, and this happens and helps transfer energy all around the globe. So there's certain latitudes on Earth where evaporation is most common. Um, that, wa that water vapor can then be um, transferred as it moves through the atmosphere to areas where precipitation is more common. So you'll notice that in the evaporation um, bands here, they're colored orange and labeled as heat absorbed because in order to evaporate water, you need to absorb heat. Then in the precipitation areas, we have that in the purple bands, which is where heat is released because precipitation in order to uh, condense gas back into a liquid, we need to release heat. So that is um, some serious fueling for um, hurricanes, which we, oops, excuse me, which we are going to get into in week three. We're going to talk more about um, uh, storms. So this is a little taste of what um, is helping to fuel hurricanes. So the very last component of um, why is water weird, water's weird properties, is the density of water. So density is the mass per unit volume. So how heavy is something for how big it is, for how much space does it take up? So it's related to the atoms in the object. How tightly packed are the atoms. Our atoms very, very, very spread out, so there's not actually much there taking up all that space, or are there tons and tons of atoms all packed really close together? For water, um, as temperature decreases, so as something gets cooler, molecules have less and less energy, which means they're going to move slower and slower and they're going to occupy less space. They're not going to be moving around as freely. They're not going to be moving as far. So as temperature decreases, substances actually um, take up less volume. This is called uh, thermal contraction. The opposite is called thermal expansion. When temperature increases, molecules will have more energy, so they will be moving faster and take up more space. Thermal expansion and thermal contraction. So the question is, why does ice float? And why is that so different from everything else? It's due to, of course, the water molecule. That's why I started the lecture talking about the water molecule specifically. So because of the geometry of the water molecule when it is um, frozen solid in ice. So as a gas, um, the molecules are freely moving around. There's no bonding between them, none of those hydrogen bonds. Um, they can move quickly, they can spread out quite far. Each molecule is on its own. In the liquid state, there's some bonding, so not all molecules are bonded together, but some of them are. They aren't moving as quickly and they aren't going to spread as far. In the solid state, for ice, for water, which is frozen into ice in a solid state, 
the hydrogen bonds will create a very um, rigid structure. So this crystalline structure, as we call it, um, it's actually three-dimensional, filled, uh, comprised of H2O molecules all bonded together with those hydrogen bonds that we talked about. So for the second part of this lecture, we are going to get more into fresh and mostly talk about salt water because this is oceanography after all. Um, now that we have a little bit of understanding of water itself on the molecular level, why it is so unique, why it's so interesting, how it allows for us to live on Earth in the climate we currently have, um, we will get into talking about um, salt water and how salt water also salinity, so how salinity, salinity values can change, increasing or decreasing, becoming more or less salty. Um, then we're going to look at reservoirs, fluxes, and uh, residence times, and then look at um, desalination. So at the end, we're going to talk about desalination, because that is often um, thought of as a source of fresh water, so we'll go over some of the pros and cons there. Then we'll talk about um, ocean profiles. So how does temperature, salinity, and density change with depth? So with depth deep into the ocean. And then also how do these things change over the surface of the globe? So from low latitudes versus high latitudes versus mid latitudes. So the first question is, if you had to guess, Fresh water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. What temperature do you think seawater freezes at? So I don't expect you to know this answer because I haven't told you yet. Take a second to think, what would you guess if you had to guess? So it is different. Seawater does freeze at a different temperature than fresh water. So that was the trick. A lot of people think, well, it would be the same. It would still be zero degrees. Seawater actually freezes at negative two degrees Celsius. So the freezing point of seawater because of uh, the salinity is actually lower. It's negative two degrees Celsius. So seawater is almost entirely freshwater. It's 96.5% uh, pure freshwater and about three and a half percent salt. So the ocean is made up of about 3.5% salt. Here is a really nice comparison chart. So between pure water and um, the average salinity of seawater, you will see that the density is different, the freezing point is different, and the boiling point is slightly different as well. So salinity, when we use the term salinity, we're talking about the total amount of material that's dissolved in the water. Remember, water is very, very good at being a solvent. It's very good at dissolving material into it because of that um, uh, bent structure. So the percentage of dissolved material in our ocean on average is about 35 parts per mil or 3.5%, which means there's about 35 grams of salt in one kilogram of water. So if you look at this pie chart here, um, the ocean is mostly water. And then a very small component is these other, um, other components, other elements. So you'll notice that NaCl <laughs> is the most common. So our um, classic table salt is NaCl, um, sodium chloride. So our average salinity is 35 parts per mil. This is this might be a new unit for you. Um, instead of percent, so one per hundred parts per mil is one per thousand. So you essentially have an extra zero here. So what that means is there are 35 grams of salt 
in one kilogram of water. So if there were 80 grams of salt in four kilograms of water, what would the salinity of the water be? Take a second to in. Remember, the answers that I'm giving you are in per mil. So what you can do here with these units that I gave you is you can, um, when you're looking at grams per kilogram, you can directly divide. So if you divide 80 grams into 4 kilograms of water, you will find that the salinity should be 20, um, not percent, but per mil. The same as when you say 35 grams into 1 kilogram is 35. So the answer here should be uh, 20. Uh, it should be B here. So if you are interested in a little more about what is in our um, seawater, you can take a look at this table here. We're not going to get too much into the chemistry of water other than um, the molecular structure, which we talked about at the start of this lecture. But if you're interested, you can take a look at all of the different things that make up um, our ocean water. So for salinity measurements, there's a couple different ways to measure salinity in the ocean. The first way would be to measure the actual mass of the salt in the water. So you can take a volume of water, evaporate all the liquid water out, and be left behind with all of the salt material. So this you would use the units of per mil or parts per thousand. So remember per mil instead of um, percent, which is parts per hundred, we have per mil as parts per thousand. The other way would be to measure the electrical conductivity. So the, the higher the salinity, so the more salt in the water, the more electricity it will conduct. So this is used uh, in certain situations, but you would use a unit of the called the practical salinity units or PSU. So the scales of per mil and PSU are very, very similar. For so for in this class, we're going to use them interchangeably. So one um, per mil is the same as one PSU. So like the example I showed before, that 35 parts per thousand is equal to um, 35 PSU for our purposes. It's so similar that we can use them um, just interchangeably like that. So here I have four images. So I would like you to think about which two of these pictures are showing processes where the water would be increasing in salinity. So here's a hot day where we have evaporation from the sun. This is rain, raining over our ocean. Here we have, um, if you don't recognize this, is the Amazon River, so the Amazon River discharging into the ocean. And here we have sea ice forming in the Arctic. Which two of these, I'll tell you, um, at the end, which two of these is showing a process that would increase salinity of the ocean water? So how to go about thinking about this is take them each one at a time. So here we have in, in A, we have um, our ocean water and the sun. So the sun is going to evaporate water out of our ocean. Evaporating water, it only evaporates the liquid H2O, which is going to leave behind all of the salt material. So if we are removing water from the ocean, 
the salt concentration is actually going to increase because there's the same amount of salt, but now there's less water. So the percentage of salt will increase. So evaporation here is, yes, increasing salinity of our ocean. B is now doing the opposite. So you're adding water to the ocean. So the rain is raining fresh water down into our ocean. So now we have more water to less percent of salt. So rain would be decreasing the salinity of the ocean. Very similarly to how here the Amazon is discharging fresh water into our ocean. So adding fresh water means you're going to have less salinity. You're going to have less salt because you're adding more fresh water. You're diluting that salt water. So it would be neither B or C. Sea ice is really interesting because only the liquid water can freeze. So as the water freezes on the surface of the ocean, so where the surface is cold enough to actually start freezing into these pancake-shaped ice, um, the salt will actually be left behind. So that water will freeze on the surface. The salt from this water is actually um, discharged into the water below. So we will have very salty water right beneath all of this frozen sea ice. So the answers here, which ones are showing increasing salinity? We have A and D. So here is um, a little summary sort of of what I just explained. So uh, salinity can change due to either adding or removing fresh water. So evaporation removes water, precipitation adds water, fresh water discharge adds water, and formation of sea ice removes water. Now the opposite of all of these will of course have the opposite effects. So you want to think about, when you're thinking about changing salinity, think about am I, um, are you diluting the ocean? So if you add fresh water, you're going to dilute it. You're going to make it less salty. Or are you removing some water? So it's going to become even more and more salty. So here I have a video to show you about um, the freezing of salt water. Excuse me, the freezing of sea ice. Sometimes winter extends its deadly reach into the shallow waters under the ice. When sea water freezes into sea ice, it releases its salt, creating super salty brine. This percolates through cracks in the ice into the sea water below. The brine then sinks because it's much denser than the surrounding water. It's also much colder, so the sea water freezes on contact, forming what's called a brinicle. Over the course of about 12 hours, the super salty ice stalactite grows, trapping anything it touches in ice. Most creatures here, like starfish, move far too slowly to escape these fingers of death. A little dismal, but there you can see 
um, you could actually see all of the uh, salty water dripping out or pooling out of that um, uh, frozen stalagmite, like they called it. It's pretty cool. You can actually visibly see the density in the water. You can see the difference in density. That's why you could see the water flowing. Um, you can actually see how salty it is. So when we think about um, variations in salinity, we can also think about uh, variations in salinity, salinity across the globe. So we can look at high areas of salinity versus low areas of salinity. So if we look at this graph, we can see that the red regions here, the red and the pink, are the higher salinity areas. And we can see the lower salinity areas are in um, the light pink, the purple, and the light blue, more in the polar regions. So when we look at salinity at the surface of the earth, but at the surface of the ocean, um, by latitude, we can also graph this way. So here we have um, the equator, and we have the North Pole, then we have the South Pole. So looking at temperature, which is in the red, we see that it's colder at the pole, it gets warmer at the equator, and it's colder at the South Pole, exactly as you'd expect. Salinity on the surface, um, at, in the ocean, however, follows a different trend. So we see low salinity at the poles, and then high salinity at about 30 degrees at the Tropic of Cancer, low salinity at the equator, high salinity at the Tropic of Cap Capricorn, about 30 degrees south, and then salinity drops back down again at the South Pole. So there's a couple different ways that salinity can um, be uh, changed around the globe. One way is due to um, the addition of new dissolved material. So this would be something like a volcanic eruption. So somewhere where um, new material can be uh, input into the ocean. So this could be different um, salts, different uh, molecules that are released during a volcanic eruption. It can also be um, different elements that are brought into the ocean from the continent through river discharge. So anything that ends up in our river, rivers, will eventually end up into our oceans. So the salinity of our ocean can be really highly impacted by um, what different um, elements and molecules are um, allowed to enter our rivers because that will then eventually find its way to the ocean. There's also some salinity um, increases and variability due to uh, plate tectonics. So you remember this. This is our mid-ocean ridge, our divergent boundary. Here we have a little transform boundary. Um, so there will be some uh, salinity, some elements added to the ocean as this uh, underwater volcanic eruption occurs. These are generally um, occurring on a rather long time scale and it would be something global. So this would not be, a, these, this type of change in salinity is not something that occurs um, over the course of an hour. It's going to be on very long time scales and it's going to affect the whole globe. So something like uh, discharge from a continent or a volcano, which is generally going to be massive. So there's going to be uh, all of, it's not going to be quite this small where there's a very teeny tiny little cloud that goes right into the ocean. It's actually generally affects um, at least the whole hemisphere when you have a big volcanic eruption. Um, and of course, the mid-ocean ridge happens very, very slowly and it happens all over the world in all of the oceans. So the next thing to think about when we talk about salinity is residence times. So residence times is how much time does that thing that you're interested, for example, salt, remain in the reservoir. So the example that I like to use is students at UCI. So let's say our reservoir is uh, the students at UCI. So we want to know how long does the average student spend 
at UC Irvine. These are not real numbers. Our school is actually quite a bit bigger. Um, I'm just using these numbers to simplify things. So the reservoir is uh, the material of interest in its given form, meaning our UCI students that are um, enrolled at UCI. The flux is the material that is changing. So we can either have a source, which is a material added to our reservoir, or a sink, which is a, re a, a material removed. So here we have our flux, our source would be freshmen, and our sink would be graduates, so the people that graduate. So in a steady state, it means that the source is equal to the sink, which means the number of people coming in each year is the same as the number of people graduating. So that means the number of people at school isn't going to change, even though those freshmen will become sophomores and juniors and seniors and then they'll graduate. There will always be the same number of students because each year we have the same number coming in that we have leaving. So the residence time is how long are the students at school? How long is each student in this reservoir? So the way to calculate that is you take the amount in the reservoir, which is 2,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 students, and you're going to divide by the total sources or the total sinks. You can only do this math if you are in a steady state, which means that the source is equal to the sink. So either way you do this, either your sources or your sinks, you're going to get the same answer because the number is the same. So here we would have two, uh, 20,000 students, which is in our reservoir, divided by the 5,000 students per year. Our answer is four years. So with these numbers, the residence time of students at UCI is four years. So if we look at this steady state, here we are talking about an element in the ocean. So here we have 160 times 10 to the 8 um, million tons in our ocean. We have 80 million tons per year input by the river. We have... Uh, 50 million tons per year as a sink from sea spray. So how much would the sink of precipitation directly of NaCl from the seawater be? In million tons per year. We have 80 coming in. We have 50 going out with sea spray. What would our sink do to precipitation from seawater be? Take a second. And remember that I said this is a steady state example. So the answer would be 30. Because it is steady state, we know that the inputs have to equal the outputs. So the source is 80, the sinks have to be 80. So we know sea spray makes up 50 of that sink. So precipitation of salt from the seawater has to make up the other 30. So now the question is, what is the residence time of Na in the ocean, of sodium in the ocean? So what is the residence time here of sodium in the ocean? Take a second to think about how you would go about solving this question. So remember, the equation for residence time is the amount in the reservoir divided by the sources or the sinks. So here we see our sources, of course, are equal to our sinks. We have 80 million tons per year in each situation. So what we would do is we take the amount in the reservoir, 160 times 10 to the 8, divided by 80 million tons per year. So what we end up with is D, 2 times 10 to the 8 years or 200 million years. So the residence time of sodium in our ocean is 200 million years. Very long time. So the next topic to cover is um, the density of seawater. So seawater is more dense than freshwater. 
Um, and the things that affect our seawater density is pressure, temperature, and salinity. So we're going to go through um, why we care about seawater density and what seawater density actually looks like in our oceans. So the first thing to think about is pressure. So as pressure increases, density increases. So this is very similar to how it works with air. Um, as pressure increases, density increases. So as you swim down, for example, into increasing pressure, the density is also going to increase. There's not a huge difference. It's only about 2% different between the surface of, of the ocean and deep ocean. So it's, it's pretty minimal, but it can be really significant for certain ocean organisms that can only live in one situation, that can only live in the surface ocean or only live in the deep ocean. So then we also think about temperature. So as temperature increases, density decreases. So if you remember, I had, we talked about um, thermal expansion and thermal contraction. So as something gets warmer, it's going to take up more space. So as temperature increases of our ocean, still liquid, so it's not increasing to the point where it's boiling and evaporating, but as temperature increases, it's actually going to take up a little bit more space. But it's still going to have the same amount of salt. So now we have more water with the same amount of salt, so the density is going to decrease going to actually be less salty as our temperature increases. The maximum density is actually at the freezing point. So the maximum density of seawater is at the freezing point of water. And then when we think about salinity, Salinity directly affects the density of our water. So as water gets saltier, the density increases. It is a very linear effect. Um, as we increase the salt content, the density of the water increases as well. So when we look at temperature, salinity, and density together, we get a plot like this, where we have um, as salinity and temperature increase, we can have changes in density. So we change our density depending on the temperature and the salinity of the water. So you can graph, let's say your salinity is um, 35 parts per thousand, your temperature is 15 degrees, you would find yourself somewhere right around here for density. So these diagonal lines are the density lines. We have salinity on the x-axis, we have temperature on the y-axis. So if you wanted to determine the salinity of water that is 5 degrees Celsius and has a density of 1.027 grams per centimeter cubed, what would you find your density to be, uh, excuse me, what would you find your salinity to be? So this is a nice example because I gave you numbers that are right on the graph. So our temperature, it says five degrees Celsius. Okay, so we know now we have to go and find the matching density. So we see this line here is 1.027 grams per centimeter cubed of density, which means if we had to plot, our point would be right here. Our salinity matches up to be 34 parts per thousand. So 34 per mil here, your answer would be B, 34 per mil with five degrees Celsius and a density of 1.027 grams per centimeter cubed. So now use the same graph to try to determine what the characteristics of the water at the very bottom of our ocean would look like. What do you think the bottom of our ocean looks like in terms of temperature and salt content? 
So in order to answer this, you have to remember that I told you as, um, I told you density increases with depth. So the highest density is going to be at the deepest point. So our high densities are going to show us what it looks like at the bottom of the ocean. So the highest densities correspond to very high salinity values and very low temperature values. So the bottom of our ocean is going to have the highest density. It will be very cold and very salty. So A, cold and salty is what we would experience at the bottom of the ocean. So here I would like to show you this very cool video of um, the way that water masses orient themselves depending on density. So the ocean will have layers depending on the density of the ocean, which depends on temperature and salinity. So take a look at this experiment here. I'm going to remove the plastic divider and see what Oops, happens. Let me start over here. I'm going to remove the plastic divider and see what happens. So blue, salt water, yellow, fresh water. He just dyed them to show. Notice that the salt water immediately Denser sinks below. blue water quickly flows under the less dense yellow water. Then we get an internal wave sloshing back and forth. You can see the surface is calm. But internally, between the two different densities, we get a wave that sloshes back and forth. And we, the divider... Separate the two sides again. We can mix one side and see what the intermediate density water does. Right in the middle. You can see that it forms an intermediate layer between the densest blue water on the bottom and the less dense yellow layers may also be mixed. So what you're seeing there is the water orienting itself by density. So that is, oh, water will always do this. The denser water will be below the less dense water. There we go. So what happens in our ocean is we have this natural lay layering effect. So there are um, two different terms we use to uh, describe the layering of our ocean. The three, two of them I have here on this slide. First we have the thermocline. So this is where depths of our ocean change temperature very, very, very rapidly. So if we look at um, depth versus temperature, you'll see that at the surface of the earth, at the surface of the ocean, excuse me, so at zero or sea level, um, we have warmer temperatures, it's getting a lot of sunlight. Um, and then as we look at the temperature with depth, there's a steep decrease till about a thousand meters deep. And then the temperature is rather constant. This area of steep decrease in temperature is called the thermocline. So the halocline is something similar, but it is where um, we're looking at the steep changes in salinity. So this is a similar graph. Here we have depth, we have zero at the top, but instead of temperature, we are looking at salinity. So where we have very large changes in salinity, we call this the halocline. So at low latitudes around the equator, we are going to have higher salinity values at the surface that will drop down to our average of about 35. At um, lower latitude, uh, excuse me, higher latitudes, so either pole, north or south, we're going to have lower salinity at the surface, which will uh, increase steeply up till our average of about 35. This area of steep change is called the halocline. So you'll notice that at the surface of the ocean, those first hundred meters, there's a lot going on in changing both temperature and salinity. So density also has um, 
a steep change in those first 1,000 meters. We call this the pycnocline. So the pycnocline is where we have um, an increase in density with depth. So that those first hundred, excuse me, those first thousand meters is where we see a huge increase in density. Um, it changes from uh, lower values up to higher values at about 1,000 meters. This area of steep change is called the pycnocline. So you're really only going to see the pycnocline at low latitudes, so at the um, areas closer to the equator, so lower latitudes. At higher latitudes, we don't see um, a pycnocline as much. We see more constant density throughout the entire water column. So at what latitude do you think surface water will be more likely to sink to the deep ocean. At what latitude might surface water, so water at the surface, be more likely to sink down to the deep ocean? Take a second, use these graphs to try and help you guess. So if you remember, denser water sinks. So like in that video, we saw that the denser water immediately went underneath the less dense water. So in this graph, looking at our pycnocline here, we have low density water at the surface at low latitudes. Then it increases with depth. So we really would never expect at low latitudes to have surface water sinking down to the deep ocean because it's much less dense. This less dense water is going to stay at the surface. This less dense water, unless there are other factors at play, has no reason to sink down because the dense water is already at the bottom. So this is very stable. We have all the dense water below, the less dense water above. At high latitudes, however, there's no pycnocline. It's rather um, constant throughout. So here, if we have a slight change in density at the surface, we would have, um, the water would absolutely be able to um, sink down because we don't have that mass of extra dense water compared to the surface below. So the answer would be high latitudes. At high latitudes is where we would expect surface water to be able to sink down. At low latitudes, we definitely do not expect surface water to sink down because we know it is so much less dense already. So for the last part of this lecture, I just want to go into um, fresh water and desalination quickly. We won't spend too much time on this, but it is interesting to know um, how desalination works and because we have some desalination plants around here in Southern California. So desalination is where we remove salt from seawater, making it fresh and able for us to drink. So fresh water is very limited on Earth. Um, fresh water makes up only about 3% of the water on Earth. And it is already very overused. Um, we, have, we use up about 54% of all of our available water and the um, estimate is that by 2025 we'll be using up to 70 percent of water um, as things continue we will see more and more water shortages so desalination is one of these ideas proposed to remove salt from seawater and use that fresh water so um, you can't drink salt water um, it will actually dehydrate you so one of the ways that people thought to make use of this 97% of all the water on the earth is to remove the salt. The problem is this takes a huge amount of energy and it produces a very, very, very salty um, waste product. So when you remove all that water, um, we call it brine. Very, 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 very salty water. So what happens is you have your seawater and your energy come in um, the separation begins and then you end up with pure water and incredibly salty sort of waste product or what we call brine.
So there's two different ways to do this. There's, um, you can use the thermal way or distillation, which actually heats the salt water, boils the water, and then collects the steam, and then um, lets the steam cool and rain out into just fresh water. That would be uh, this here. There's also the membrane option, which is similar to osmosis. It really is osmosis. It forces salt water across um, certain membranes that salt cannot go through. So the water will go through, the salt is trapped on the other side. So which of these here are the reason that the thermal type of desalination requires a huge amount of energy? So which property of water, which we went over today, is the reason that thermal desalination requires a huge amount of energy, especially if we were to try and scale this up to uh, the commercial scale. Is it because water is a powerful solvent, it has high specific heat, or it has a high latent heat of vaporization? Take a second to guess. If you realize that this thermal desalination requires evaporation, you would notice that C would be the answer. So this really doesn't have much to do with water being a solvent because in this case, the salt is already dissolved. Um, the specific heat, we are not talking about specific heat. We are actually talking about latent heat. So it's going to require a lot of energy to dissolve, uh, excuse me, to evaporate the ocean water, to evaporate the ocean and leave the seawater behind. This takes a huge amount of energy. Um, some facilities will actually use uh, multiple steps to try and uh, reduce the energy necessary. So if you break it down into smaller little pieces, instead of trying to warm up an entire vat of water all at once, um, you can save a bit of energy. So then there's also the uh, membrane approach. So this is where you have some sort of semi-permeable membrane. Um, you can, um, in order to use desalination, you need reverse osmosis, where you have your seawater, that you apply some sort of pressure to force this water through the membrane, which catches all the salt and leaves um, almost pure water coming through. The problem with this, however, is you have to apply pressure, which again cause it, uh, requires a lot of energy. So both of these um, products do, or both of these possibilities do require quite a bit of energy consumption. So if you're interested in um, desalination, I do have a little bit more info in these figures, but we're not going to go through too much of that today. So one of the big problems with desalination is you have to think about um, the economic considerations. So it's actually very, very, very much more expensive to produce water from desalination than it would be to use groundwater or water from rivers and lakes. And that's because you have to build the desalination plants. So you need a very expensive plant, you need people to run and man maintain that plant, and you need a huge amount of energy to force this desalination. So if we increase the use of desalination to get our water, it will most definitely result in um, higher water bills for the people that are using that water. So there's also some pretty negative impacts on the ocean when we think about desalination. So here is a figure, but I will just go to my summary. So you have to take in a lot of water. So a high volume of water is drawn into your uptake pipes, and that has to be done very, very carefully in order to not damage the ecosystems where you're taking that water from. Desalination also creates a huge amount of wastewater. So there's a lot of um, wastewater that will, will be produced, which we call brine, because it's incredibly salty. So what we're doing is we're increasing the salinity of our ocean. We are essentially taking out fresh water and putting the salt back in. So we take out our ocean water, we separate the salt, and then we put the salt back into the ocean. So this can be um, very damaging when 
that is not the natural way the ecosystem is used to working. Um, and then also the energy necessary. So the energy that's necessary to run um, the desalination, unless there's a way to do it um, carbon free, unless the different desalination plants are um, carbon free plants, then there's going to be a large increase in um, carbon dioxide to our atmosphere, which is going to increase our atmospheric warming um, as we try to use these desalination approaches. So we do have some desalination in place in California. So there is the um, Carlsbad plant in Carlsbad, uses reverse osmosis, it opened in 2015. Um, it intakes about 100 million gallons of water per day, but it produces about 50 million gallons of fresh water per day. And this makes up about 10% of the water that's used in San Diego. There is a new plant going in in Huntington, as well as there's a plant at least planned for Monterey. I don't know if it has um, begun building yet or not. So if we look at the water in California, so our water usage, you can actually see that um, agriculture makes up 80% of all of the water that's used in California. Urban use is about 20%. And then when we look at the agriculture, we see um, the most uh, water withdrawals are due to fruit and nut farming and um, alfalfa. So there's a lot of alfalfa grown in Central California, um, as well as uh, fruit and nuts, which take up a huge amount of the water that we have in California and the water that we use. So if we look at desalination around the world, you can see there are a couple of other countries that are heavily relying on desalination. Um, we are up there, though, of the countries that uh, rely on desalination for the amount of water that we use. Notice that the only countries relying, most of the countries relying on desalination are quite close to the coast. It would be pretty hard to rely on something like this if you were very far inland. So that is what I have for you today for week two, part one. Um, on Thursday, we will get into ocean circulations and currents. Uh, I hope to see you all on Tuesday at... Um, 1030 or if you're watching this afterwards I hope that I saw you on Tuesday at 1030 for your discussion um, and then good luck with all of the week two part one uh, materials on the module the quiz and the homework remember um, feel free to shoot me an email or RTA Chris if you have any questions as you're working through things